Are ready for the word? You have the young preacher today. Okay, if you were here last week, you know what I'm talking about. You have the young preacher today. Why don't we stand one more time and move your hands and your shoulders a little bit. Loosen up and open up your hands one more time so that we can pray together. Lord, we thank you for your presence. Lord, we thank you for all that you've been doing. Lord, and thank you that we can open up our hearts for the word. Lord, and we do that right now. Lord, we've opened our hearts in worship. Lord, we've remembered, and now we're eating manna from heaven. We're ready to receive. Lord, we pray that you will speak to us and that we will understand what the Spirit of the Lord has to say to us today. Lord, uh, we are here with ears to hear and with eyes to see what heaven has to say. Let it be on earth as it is in heaven. Bless the word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. So at the, um, at, at, at the office once in a while, we talk about uh, all these uh, translations that are out there right now. I remember growing up over in the Netherlands, and we had three to four translations of the Bible that you can pick from. But then moving here to Canada and, and getting to know English, I discovered that there is almost just as many Bible translations that, that there are fish in the sea. <laughs> there is a lot of translations. And we were talking about that uh, the other day, and I saw something that I want to share with you. It's actually what if a, a little kid would tell their mom that they're uh, hungry, and if that would be in the Bible in different Bible translations. I'm going to show it on the screen. So if that would have been said in the Message Bible, the little girl would say, Mama, I'm hungry. Mama. I'm hungry. If that would be in the Amplified Bible, it would say, Mommy, I'm hungry. And then between brackets, it would say, Famished, comma, starving. Now, if this would be in the NIV, the little kid would say, Mama, Mother, I am hungry. If this would be in the King James Version, it would be, Henceforth, let it be known unto thee, birth giver, that my belly consists of emptiness. <laughs> but whatever translation you hold, God is going to speak to you today. Amen? I am going to speak to you about your best you. Your best you. That's what I'm going to open up about. And for myself, I've, I have a document that I have that, that has some principles that I use for my life. Uh, I've said that here before, that I don't want to be governed by my feelings or by my emotions. I believe it's good to have some healthy principles in life. And I've got several principles. Uh, and one of them is based in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, is therefore give your lives as living sacrifices. And I want to give my life as a living sacrifices to the Lord. And the way I wrote it down is I want to be the best version of myself before the Lord as a gift to Him. And not, not to promote myself or to be good, but I want to be the best version of myself in accordance to his plan for my life. And last week, and actually Dr. Russ mentioned it even just now, Dr. Russ mentioned John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whosoever believes in him. That's the non-negotiable in the Bible, that God gave his son as a living sacrifice that we're remembering even especially today so that whosoever and once you become a whosoever that's your start of becoming your best you do you know that that's your start of becoming that best version of yourself because you can never discover the best version of yourself by yourself you need revelation from heaven how God has designed you when you were in your mother's womb, God already thought about you. You're God's idea. You're not here just by coincidence. God has planned you, and God has planted you. God has positioned you, and you are here or online with a specific reason. And God knows what he's doing. He doesn't make mistakes. Even if your parents made a mistake when they produced you, that you are here is not a mistake. Never. Never even think that. You're God's plan. You have a purpose, and he has a best version of you in mind. Whosoever believes in him. So as soon as you come to the Lord, you will discover that God has a plan for you. It's not only for those who get the big words that you all know about. Everybody in heaven, there's, there's things in heaven for all of us. For all of us. So today, I want to make that a little bit more practical. So how does that work? How do you become your best you? What does it look like to be born again? See, that scripture, John chapter 3, 16, is in the third chapter of, uh, of John. 
And, uh, and every scripture in the Bible always has a context. We always talk about that, that every, every scripture has a context. So if you look at John 3.16, God so loved the world, it has a context. And especially John, the writer of the Gospels, he is different than the other ones. Uh, the other ones are more historical and in a certain order. But John the Apostle has a, has a different plan behind his writing. He wants to reveal something. He's very intentional in what he writes. So he skips a few things and he goes fairly fast. In the first chapter of, of, of the Gospel of John, it's very clear right away that Jesus is the Son of God through whom even the earth has, has, has started to exist. And then in John chapter 2, Jesus goes to this uh, uh, wedding party and he changes water into wine and Jesus chooses some disciples and all of that goes very quickly uh, in the first couple of chapters. Actually in chapter 2 uh, John places this at a total different place than the other gospel writers do. The other gospel writers do the turning of the tables that we spoke about three weeks ago. I don't know if you remembered but we had the table that Jesus would have turned and we were challenged like hey are you sitting at a table that Jesus would have turned. That moment that Jesus did that in the Gospel of John is just before we come to that chapter in which John says, or the Gospel John writes, Jesus says, uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So Jesus did a few things. And right after that thing, going into the temple, turning those tables upside down, you will see a few things that I want you to pay attention to today. And I want to show you what's happening. So let's go to the end of chapter 2 of John, the Gospel of John. So he has just turned the tables. He's just picked some disciples. He has just turned water into wine. And then we see Jesus doing this. Because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust in him. Other translations say many put their faith in him. And I like this. It's, it's one of these mind-boggling scriptures to me. But Jesus didn't trust them. So they trusted him, but he didn't trust them. Because he knew all about people. Jesus knows all about people. No one needed to tell him about human, human nature. Because he knew what was in each person's heart. So Jesus comes to the scene. He's the creator. He's God. He picks some disciples, turns water into wine, goes into the temple, and kind of totally messes up the religious systems, at least in the way they were doing things, basically saying, man, you guys have your own handbook that is not in alignment with the Bible. I'm turning it upside down, and I'm doing these miracles, and I'm glad that you're following me, but I'm not trusting you yet, because in order for you to really move into your destiny... For you, in, for you, in order to become your best you, something more needs to happen than that you just follow me because of my miracles. That you just follow me because I called you out. That you just follow me because I turned water into wine. I'm not trusting you yet. You might be following me. You might be coming to church. But coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. The famous saying, right, when we go to McDonald's, that doesn't mean that we become a hamburger. <laughs> Jesus knew there's more that needs to happen. And John very strategically places these things in the Bible. And in John chapter 3 and John chapter 4, we see two encounters that Jesus had with two different people. A man and a woman. Those two are totally opposite almost. And in the midst of that conversation, the first one with, with the man, and then in between, before he talks to the woman, that's where this phrase is placed. One phrase is, you need to be born again. And the other phrase is, for God so loved that he gave his only son. So there's something very specific going on here. God is showing something. Jesus is showing something like, hey, if you want to become your best you, you need to be born again. And that being born again and that becoming a whosoever is packed in between these two people who meet. I could really preach long about this one, but I won't go too deep on this one because I've got something very specific to go to later on to help you understand what this looks like. But let's for a moment look at these two guys, these two people. It's not two guys. 
The man has a name, and his name is Nicodemus. The woman has a name, but we don't know it. She just shows up. I have a little list. I compared them. I can show it right here. Nicodemus came during the night. She came during the day. He was a man. She was a woman. He was a Jew. She was a Samaritan. He was searching. He probably was in a temple and he saw Jesus do all these things. And all these people were upset. And he said, I need to talk to this Jesus who turns water into wine and now has some disciples. And this is a rabbi who's obviously doing something new. I want to find out, but I need to do it secretly. So I'll do it during the night so that nobody knows. But he was curious. He wasn't against Jesus. But he, he, was, he was stuck in his religious system, though. And that religious system kind of blocked him. But he wanted to know. And he wanted to see. He wanted to be a follower like all the other followers were already following Jesus. But it shouldn't be known because his peers were kind of against Jesus because they were upset with Jesus. So he comes during the night. He is searching. This woman was not searching at all. She was astray. She just showed up somewhere. And then Jesus started to reach out to her. Totally opposite. So interesting. He was a respected leader. She was an outcast. When you even read how he talks, he was very serious. She was nonchalant, just minding her business. Oh, you want some water? I'll get you some water. Nicodemus took initiative with Jesus. With her, the woman that we don't even know, Jesus takes initiative with her. This is so intentional. It shows something so beautiful. How Jesus wants to take the initiative. How Jesus comes to look for you. How he is the good shepherd reaching out to the lost. And he comes to seek and save the lost. That's what he's doing right here. Nowhere it says if Nicodemus became born again or not. There are some theories that later on he did. So probably it's not that he was lost and she was found. But it was a little bit harder for him to eventually really catch what Jesus wanted with, with him and her. He was very respectful. He was very polite. He called Jesus rabbi. Sometimes in church we can tell, tell Jesus all. We can be very respectful towards Jesus. Use the right words. She was suspicious towards him. If you really read about it, she was almost rude towards Jesus. He didn't care. She was at least real with Jesus. And Jesus liked that. Because he came to her. If you really look at it, you see that the more the story progresses, Nicodemus at the end of the story starts talking less and less, and Jesus starts talking more and more. If you have a red letter Bible, you will see at the beginning it's black, and at the end it's all red. Jesus is talking, he's listening. If you read about the woman in the next chapter, actually it's interesting, she starts talking more and more and more and more. It's two opposites. With Nicodemus, there's no record of how it ended. With her, she got born again, and she turned her whole city upside down. That's the last verse of chapter 3. The whole city came to Jesus. See, Jesus is coming and doing his thing, and he's wanting to change people. And we read that at the last verse of chapter 2. Even though they were putting faith in him, he didn't trust them yet, because he knew that something needed to happen in their heart. They needed a heart transplant. They needed a different heart. In order for them to become the best you, something needed to happen on the inside that is a supernatural miracle that when even Nicodemus asked about it, Jesus couldn't totally explain it. He said, it's like the wind. It is not, it's not explainable, but it's Holy Spirit doing a work in you so that you will be changed from the inside and now you'll be born again. And if there's anything in my heart today, because I know that especially also here in North America, we have the term born again Christian. Are you born again? He was like, yes, hallelujah, I'm born again. <laughs> that should never become a little title that we now have in our religious handbook. And now we all say we're born again, but we have no clue what born again means. Just born again doesn't mean that you do all the things that Nicodemus and all these people did. Now we have a new religious system and we call it born again, but it's not born again. 
Because born again means that you really are born again. <laughs> that something happens in you. That in your spirit, your spirit gets a rebirth. A new fire that the Holy Spirit does as a miracle in you. And from that moment, something rises up that never rose up before. It's a supernatural miracle from the Lord. And you cannot work for it. You cannot deserve it. You cannot make it happen. This woman at the, world, at the well wasn't even looking for it. But once you have that encounter with Jesus, it will totally, totally change you. I'll read it. John chapter 3, verse 1. That's at the beginning of the conversation with Nicodemus. There was a man named Nicodemus, John 3, verse 1. A Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. He was still just following on what he saw. Just the miraculous signs, all the things that God can do for you. But Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So you need a supernatural miracle, born again. I'm going to just read some scriptures just to help you because we're going somewhere very specific this morning. Galatians 6.15 says this, it doesn't matter whether we've been circumcised or not. Whether you're Nicodemus or the Samaritan woman who wasn't circumcised. What counts is whether we've been transformed into a new creation. The world is in need of the new creation to rise up like never before. Because the word is hopeless. And we will not fix anything in this world. We can't. Unless we... Allow Holy Spirit to do that work in us and walk into that new creation. A new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Your best you. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. That's the born again life. So how does that work? What does it look like? I want to make that more specific today so that you'll walk home here today and you know, I, I get this. I understand how we can walk in this. See, it starts with that supernatural miracle. One person that I, I could preach about this one very long too, and I'll just highlight him shortly because I'm going to use a scripture that he wrote. He's one of the 12 disciples, one of the 12 disciples that I really love for many reasons. And his name is Peter. Peter. His name first was Simon. And after his encounter with Jesus... Jesus gave him a new name, gave him the name Peter, meaning the rock. But he tried to be a rock out of his own strength, and he couldn't. He was a human being. Jesus said to him, hey, on this rock I will build my church. But just when Jesus was in the heat of his battle, hanging on the cross, this little rock betrayed him. And he had to come to the end of himself before he, become, he could become the rock on which, his, on which Jesus would build his church. He had to come to the end of himself. He had to face his own demons. He had to face his own things. He had to face his own heart. He was thinking, I can do it. He was a businessman. He knew how to do it all. He stepped out and walked on water. He talked sometimes too soon. But at the end, at the crucial moment, in the transition before he could be used by God, on Pentecost Sunday, to preach a message that would result in 3,000 people getting saved. He needed a change of heart. He needed a born-again experience. He needed to come to the end of himself and then allow God to do a work in him and say, man, I cannot be this rock on which this church can be built. I need to fall upon the rock, capital R. And only when I fall on the rock, capital R, and I die to self. So when Jesus was restoring, restoring him in John chapter 21, he was like thinking, God, I, I, I can't be in your presence. But God restored him. And at the end said, hey, you can feed my lamb. You can feed my sheep. I want to use you. Because now you've died to your own strength. Jesus knew what was in Simon Peter's heart. And Jesus walked with him in a way that he came to the end of himself. But then God helped him. That the little rock could now lean on the big rock. And that little rock was used by God to help thousands and thousands and thousands of people to live the born again experience. So I pay attention what this Peter has to say. 
So I read the books that Peter wrote, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. And, and again, I can't, I can't do it all in one message, but if you read the first chapter of the first letter of Peter, he talks about the born-again experience. He talks about that he knows what it is to be born again. First Peter, I won't read it so you don't have to put it on the screen, but if you take notes, First Peter 1.3 talks about that. It is by his great mercy that we've been born again. And later on in that same chapter, Peter says it again. Verse 23 of the first chapter, for you have been born again. So he talks about born again. So he knows what he's talking about. He experienced it. He went through it. And he knows what he's talking about. So from that perspective, I want to read together 1 Peter 2. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, yeah, those five verses. And then help you see a few things. So that you can see and understand what it means to be born again. First Peter 2, 1 says this. So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you need to be born again. You must crave sp pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for Christ for this nourishment. Now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. In these five verses, there's a, very, there's a few very practical things. Normally I have three points, today I have four. But especially the first one. It's so, so important. Four points based on this scripture. And the first thing you need to do if you're born again is you need to change your clothes. You need to change your clothes. I want to talk to you for just a second about my clothes. I, uh, I have seen my whole wardrobe. I brought it with me today. And uh, I'll talk to you about that in, in just a second. Yeah, that's, that's out of my closet. And... Uh, I, uh, I grew up in a family with my parents. They had a clothing store uh, in, the, in, the, in the center of the town, and, and they would sell clothes. So I had it easy, because whenever I needed clothes, we would literally, we lived above, so we would go down and we would pick clothes. And uh, at first it was very easy, and later on, sometimes I thought, okay, okay, my man, my parents always pick clothes for me. Like, what if I want to wear those clothes? And he said, well, those clothes are in the store. Like, <laughs> they're free. So why would you not go somewhere else if you have it for free in the store, right? And, um, and I remember that um, when I was about 16, 17 years old, um, you know, you, you, sometimes your peers can be so nice to you, right? We all know that. Like peers when you're 16, 15, they're the nicest people in the world. And I was wearing some clothes picked by my parents. And... Uh, and this guy in class just said, hey, Leon, or he would have said Lodewijk, because that's my name in the Netherlands. Where did you get those clothes? From a, from a Salvation Army store? Or is that what your parents sell in your store? And that, whoa, in the middle of the class. So, yeah, that hurt. It did hurt. I felt rejected. And then there was something about clothes that I struggled with, actually, to be honest, even in the years later. Um, I discovered even my own theology was a little bit, you cannot buy expensive clothes. I would have never worn something like this. Today, my son actually helped me pick my clothes. I asked him to pick my clothes. Didn't he do a great job? <laughs> I am, and I'll talk to you about it later, but I'm, I am wearing his shoes. We have the same size. He said, Dad, you need to wear these shoes today. And I said, sure, son, I'll wear these shoes today. But back then, with some of my clothing, whatever experience, I even thought, okay, yeah, if, if you're being used by God, you need to live poor and you shouldn't, you shouldn't spend too much money on things that you like for yourself. So I, I, I chose simple clothes. I chose clothes that would make sure that I wouldn't be noticed too much because I thought for the Lord, I do that. So 
I had three experiences that kind of messed up my, my style. <laughs> that kind of messed up my, my dress code. Uh, number one, I had some peers kind of shooting at me. Number two, I had my parents choosing what I should wear for me. And then number three, my theology was telling me what I could wear and what I couldn't wear. My handbook had all kinds of things. And in the last couple of years, actually, the Lord showed me a different side of that coin, and that's where I wear with college. This is my, uh, my weather clothes, whatever you call it, the <laughs> whatever it is. But I had to discover a few things surrounding it. And here's a, a thing that I want you to understand, because it will, it, it's all intentional where we're going. But this is what we often say. This is a saying that the world has. Clothes make the man. Right? That's what we think. That's what we all say. The way you dress will determine how you behave and where you'll go. You will become what you wear. You are what you wear. I want to kind of throw that one overboard and give you the kingdom version of that same thing. <laughs> because there is truth about this one. Clothes reflect the man. Clothes reflect the man. What you wear on the outside is actually connected to your inside. And I'll show you that a little bit more specific. See, yesterday, it was Saturday, and on Saturday, a lot of times I do stuff around the house, but I didn't feel like it. I didn't feel like working around the house. And a lot of times in the morning, before I get dressed for going outside or whatever, I have to pick what clothes I wear. And sometimes I wear clothes that kind of prevent me from having to do work around the house because these clothes are too nice for it, right? But then there is other clothes, and I'll show you some of them. And, uh, and I'll, I'll bring this in a little bit just for a moment. And, uh, oh, there is my suit pants. But here are some clothes that I actually took out of, my, um, out of my closet. So what did I do yesterday? I, I put on this pants. It has all paint stains and stuff, right? You see that? This is my, uh, this is my working jeans outfit. And I discovered something when I put this on together with uh, this T-shirt. Got this also from, uh, this is from uh, Peacock Lumber. I got it from one of our church members who works there. And uh, this, is, this is what I work, this is what I wear when I work around the house. I actually have a jacket that I used to love a lot because it was really nice and new. But then after years, this jacket is probably 25 years old. It is a leather jacket. But this is also what I wear when I go outside to work. See, clothes reflect the inside. And this is what I discovered yesterday, actually, as I was doing this. I discovered when I was putting on my work, clo work clothes, in my mind, I was ready to work. Before I turned on, put these clothes on, I wasn't. As soon as I put on the clothes that were in alignment with what I was doing and what was needed to be done from the inside, something changed. See, and if you then look at all these clothes, there's, there's several things. These, these clothes reflect me. These are a reflection of a lot of things that go on on the inside of me. When we bought our house, we actually got it with an uh, old hot tub, 20-year-old hot tub. And they said that it didn't uh, work anymore, so we should throw it away or whatever. But I was able to fix it. I fixed the hot tub. So and it's working really well. So we now have a really nice hot tub. And when I go into the hot tub, I don't wear this. <laughs> I don't. I need to get outside. So before I go outside, I wear this. Right? I wear something that is in alignment with what's going on on the inside, what needs to be done. I like to play sports. I actually like uh, to play uh, squash. And when I go play squash, I wear this. This is my little squash shirt. When there is a wedding, I wear this one. I have some other ones, but this is one of my favorites. This is my wedding suit. Now I have some other jackets too. This is what happened in Canada. And these are three outside jackets. <laughs> it's so interesting because the weather in Canada is a little bit unpredictable. Um, so if it is summer, I have this jacket. If it's a little cold, I put this one over it. Then, and Pastor Doug used to laugh at me when I would uh, put this one on. Uh, because I would do that in September, and he would say, like, man, it's already so hot still. What are you doing? Are you ready for winter? But as soon as it was getting a little bit colder, I would put this on, because with my little bald head, I don't want to get cold. 
So even because of that, I, I have this little hat that I wear so that my head doesn't go cold, right? I've got all kinds of stuff. And this is, this is the high level one. This is what I'm wearing right now because as soon as it goes below, so below zero, I need to wear a jacket that protects me because I don't want to freeze in the Canadian, beautiful Canadian, beautiful Canadian. Not a lot of snow this year. That's the prophecy for this year. Are you in agreement? But um, if it gets cold on a nice sunny day, you need to wear this. Bottom line is, what you wear is in alignment with what's going on on the inside. Now from that, I want to read a few scriptures and make you think about this. So clothes reflect the man. It reflects the mode that you're in. 1 Peter 2, 1 says, we read it, get rid of all evil behavior, all evil, evil behavior. <laughs> that word, get rid of, is a word, take off. It's a word that has to do with clothing. It has to do with, you take something off that you're wearing. Get rid of all the behavior, because now something has changed in your inside. Your behavior needs to align with your inside. Amen? And it's a strong word. It's not just a word like, maybe try to get rid of, but it's a strong word like, get rid of it. Take it off. Take off this jacket. Get rid of all evil behavior. It's not that your evil behavior or getting rid of evil behavior will make sure that that's the only way to get saved. You're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and that alone. But now that you're saved and now that you're born again, your clothing needs to match the new reality. Your, coat, your clothing needs to be in line with that new creation that you are on the inside. But if you're a new creation on the inside, but on the outside you keep wearing these old clothes that you now should not be wearing anymore. If I would have worn this thing today, my thing for doing work around the house to church today, my clothing would not be in alignment with my assignment for today. Amen? Yes, you can clap for that. I'm excited about it. So you need to get rid of all evil behavior. Be done. Strong language. If you want to be born again and live it, if you want to be your best you, be done. Be determined. I'm not wearing this coat anymore. Be done with deceit. That's what the world does right now. We're living in a deceitful world. Be done with hypocrisy. Be done. Those clothes are not in your closet anymore with hypocrisy, with jealousy, and all unkind speech. That's a big one. What clothes are you wearing when you're on Facebook? What clothes are you wearing when you're on Instagram? What's coming out? What are the clothes that you're wearing? The old creation or the new creation? You can pick and choose, even though your inside has changed. Sometimes maybe your inside has changed, but you're still wearing clothes from the old wardrobe. You need to change your wardrobe. You need to wear some different clothes. We will not be a witness to this world if we clothe the same way as they are. If we wear the same thing. The Bible said, get rid of this. Some other scriptures that say the same things. Romans 13, 12 says this. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation We'll soon be here. This is the same Greek word that's used in this sentence. So remove, take off your dark deeds like dirty clothes. It literally says it here. Take it off like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. See, I liked it that I asked my son, hey, help me get dressed. Because for me, it's an example. If I ask Jesus, Jesus. Help me get dressed. And my son literally said, hey, I want you to wear my shoes. I think you can fit them. So I'm wearing my son's shoes. And for me, it's a picture of, Lord, I want to wear the shoes that you give me. I want to wear the pictures, or sorry, I want to wear the shoes of the son of the living God that he gives me. Those shoes I want to wear. Yes, I, I like that. Remove. Your dark deeds like dirty clothes. And put on the shining armor of right living. Ephesians 4.21 says this. Since you've heard about Jesus 
and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off, again, the same Greek word, take off, take off that jacket, your old sinful nature and your former way of life. This is something you do. You cannot pray for this. It's something you do because you are now a new creation, because you're now born again. Now you just throw it off, not in order to become holy, but because you are holy on the inside. Now you're going to wear the clothes that are in alignment with who you are in Christ. Get rid of, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust. And deception. And lust is not only the thing in the sexual area, by the way. Lust is what you want for the biggest car, the biggest house, and all of that stuff. Lust has everything to do. The lust of the flesh is that you want something that you don't have. And you long for it. Get rid of that. That jacket should not be in your wardrobe any longer. Instead, verse 23, let the Spirit renew your thoughts. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts. Let the Spirit change your wardrobe. And your attitudes. Put on. So now you're clothing yourself. The Greek word here is put it on. Clothe yourself. The Greek word literally can be translated as sink into a garment. So put on a jacket. Put on the garment of your new nature. Created to be like God. Truly righteous. Truly holy. This is something you can do. You can put it on, you can put it off. One more. Colossians 3, 7. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. So that's what the writer was saying here. You used to do this. But now, because you're a new creation, because you're born again, because Jesus died for you and rose for you, and now because of him, because of his grace, you're now different. It's the time to get rid of, same word again, of anger. Rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. Don't lie to each other. For you have stripped off your old sinful nature. It's all you, 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 you. You have stripped it off. It's because of Christ that you're now a new creation. That's his work. But now that he has changed your inside... All of these things are outside behavior things. It's what other people see. It's the outside thing. It's the clothes that people see. Put on your new nature, verse 20. Sorry, verse 10. And be renewed. Again, be renewed. As you learn to know your creator and become like him. As you learn to know your creator and become like him. See, here's the thing that I quickly want to do. And I'll be watching time. I'm good. But I think it's good to finish this one, okay? Are you with me? And if you need to go eat somewhere, then feel free. But it's funny because I need to take this one off. And there is another coat in here that actually my son was doubting. You should wear this one or the other one. But just for you to see the second half of my message, that it's different. You take off the one. I was doubting this one because it's very white in total. But at the same time, I like it. Dressed in white. Dressed in white. God has dressed you in white. He's given you new clothes to wear. That's the new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Amen? (laughs) So the other three are not as long and lengthy. But I still want to say them so that you can take them with you. If you take a notes, go to notestheembassy.church and you can put it all down. But the second one you have to do is now that you know that, now that you have the new clothes, you need to crave the word. Crave the word. Be hungry for the word. Because in order to find a new way, in order to discover the new wardrobe, you need to go to not the Christian handbook that everybody else has written, but you need to go to the word, the word of God. 1 Peter 2, 2 says this, like newborn babies, you must crave, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment. I like that language. It's like a baby. Ah, what is? 
That's what I hope that you're doing here on Sunday. That as the word is being unfolded to you and that you're listening to this, this is like, I'm craving it, I need this. It's like going to the gas station. You need to be filled up with gas so that you can drive all week. If you receive the word, and that's not only here on Sundays, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you can read your Bible, you can do all these things. It's not because of religious standards that you have to do it, and if you don't do it, then you're a bad Christian. No, 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 none of that. But it is you want to understand that new wardrobe, what God has for you, and you crave it. You want to know what's in the word. You crave the word. The third point is to be sure to come to Christ all the time. 1 Peter 2, 4 says this, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God. You are coming to Christ. And that don't only do it when you give your life to Christ, but do it every day. That's what I do every day. Lord, I come to you. I ask you to govern me. I ask you to pick my shoes. I ask you to help me get dressed well today. Lord, before I go to my earthly wardrobe, I go to my heavenly wardrobe and I say, Jesus, is there any clothes that you want me to wear today? How do I deal with this world that is so full of anger and so full of this and suspicion and all of that stuff? Help me to wear your clothes. I come to Christ. I crave the word. I come to Christ. Change my clothes. Come to Christ. And the fourth very simple thing that you can do is take your place. Take your place. 1 Peter 2.5 says this, you are living stones. That God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. A few verses ahead, verse 9 of the same chapter, says this. You're not like that because you're now God's chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result... You can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out, out of the darkness, into his wonderful light. For he called you out, out of the darkness, into his wonderful light. For he called you out, out of the darkness, into his wonderful light. Are you happy about this? For he called you out, out of the darkness, into his wonderful light. You are a new creation. And it is time for you, church, and I want to ask musicians to come just for a moment of ministry, uh, to, to just to play some keyboard too, uh, just so that we can allow Holy Spirit to minister in this moment. And you're already there. You're amazing. <laughs> and uh, I believe, I believe that God is inviting you today to change your wardrobe. You might be dressing up a certain way Wearing some clothes because of peer pressure, because of what your peers have forced you to wear. You might be wearing some clothes because of how you were raised, the clothes that your parents made you wear. You might be wearing some clothes that you're wearing because of religious things. And Jesus is coming to you like he's coming to the woman at the well. He's taking the initiative today. He's coming to you. He's inviting you to let go of all your religious things. He said that the woman, rivers of living water will flow out of you once you experience this. Something will happen to your inside. I want to give you clothes that are in alignment with what's really going on on the inside. And in all these scriptures, they were all very (laughs) beautiful in the sense that it was action words. Jesus did something, he took action, and you get to respond. So if you want this today, if you want Jesus to change your wardrobe, if you say, Lord, I, I, I want to live this life more and stronger, I'm not asking you to be born again. I'm not asking you to give your life to the Lord right now. I'm talking to Christians, non-Christians, whoever it is, all of us. But if you want to do that more, allow Jesus to change your wardrobe. I want you to take one simple action. Very simple. Just stand up. Just stand up. That's it. Just stand up. Throw off. Take on. Put off. Put on. And by the way, 
I don't believe in peer pressure in church. So it's never that if one person stands up, now you feel that you have to stand up as well, all of that. Nope, that's not what we do here. Some people might be sitting down because they want to sit down and they feel that the Lord has already done this. They're already fully wearing the clothes or whatever. So we don't look around like that. But I want to ask you for a moment, just open up your hearts, open up your hands. And I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. Holy Spirit, you're welcome. You're welcome in this house. You're welcome in this church. And I asked you this earlier in the service to just minister to the body of Christ. And I ask you that again to just do it right now. Just minister to your people and change the wardrobe. I know that there's people in here that on the inside, they know they're born again. But they might sometimes still be wearing these clothes of deception, sinful nature, lust of the flesh, deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, unkind speech, whatever it is, big or small. And I see in the spirit that the Lord is just gently taking it off, taking it off, taking it off, giving you new shoes, giving you his shoes, giving you a new wardrobe, dressed in white, because he's clothing you. And you're wearing different clothes because you already are a new creation. You are a new creation because of his work on the cross. As you walk out today, you can take the elements with you. That's his work that he has done for you. You cannot get saved by your own strength, by wearing the right clothes. If that were the case, then clothes would make the man. But your clothes reflect your inner man. And I release in Jesus' name right now a greater anointing on your life to let your outward garment be in alignment with your inward assignment identity and who you are in Christ that you will no longer wear the wardrobes of your sinful nature but that you will take on and put on and wear with pride not arrogance with confidence the new clothes that the Lord has given you. And let it be reflected in your speech, speech, in your eyes, in your attitude, in your speaking and in your silence, in all those things. Let it be so that this week at work or in your marriage or wherever you go that people will say, hey, what's happened with you? Something has changed. Are you wearing a new wardrobe? I kind of like that. That looks good. Let it be like that, but Lord, in the name of Jesus, that people will see it. That will pe people will see the change. Because now what we're wearing on the outside is in alignment with who we truly are on the inside. Your best you. Lord, I want to be your best me. Let's give the Lord a hand. Hallelujah. 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 Be blessed. You may be seated. And thank you for listening.